Hello and welcome to the Runners World podcast with me, Rick Pearson. And me, Ben Hobson. Today we're talking with Mara Yamauchi about her new book, Marathon Wisdom. Hmm. Wisdom, Ben. That's what people come here for, isn't it? I think so. I hope so. I mean, certainly not from us, but the guests certainly help perhaps in that aspect. <laughs> yeah, and I think this one is, is a good example of, um, I'm a big fan of like real actual experts writing expert books. Do you know what I mean? You're I like, do. I've heard that that is a sensible <laughs> approach to absorbing information. As opposed to the sort of the uh, the Instagram influencer who's worked out the key to, to marathon running based on one marathon. Whereas we've got Mauri Yamuchi, she, she's the third fastest British female ever. I mean, she was second fastest only until recently. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And she gets into it, doesn't she? And we talks about the the kind of the big difference that shoes are making. It's not all about shoes. If you're bored no, by no, that no, debate, no. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, there's other stuff in there as well. Very but, much uh, to stipulate. We we do touch upon it as some as a previous holder of a record uh, outside the modern era of shoe stuff. It was interesting yes, to get her yes. take on on what that meant to her, and she's very honest about it. And I kind of see both the sort of thing that what she's talking about. You know, which, totally. anyway, yeah. and you'll have to listen to find out. But anyway, she makes a very sort of concise argument for for and against. So yes, and I think she's still someone who goes under the radar a little bit because everyone knows about Paula Radcliffe and obviously you know her being the fastest British female. She's on the TV and all the rest of it. And Maria Mucci is you know was second fastest to fairly recently. Is a brilliant runner. Is a brilliant commentator as well. But she's probably possibly someone that people don't know as much about as they should. And some of her training methods that she suggests, I think, are quite unusual. Um, and kind of based on some Japanese running that she, she spent a lot of time in Japan. So it's worth just sticking around to hear Mara's uh, take on what, what marathon runners should be doing. Because I don't think actually it's that expected, some of it. Mm. No, for sure. Mm. Ooh, mm. curveball. Ooh, what have you been up to then, Ben? Um, uh, do you know what? I've been having a lovely time, Rick. <laughs> um, so I feel like... I've got, it, it, I don't know how everyone else is getting on with with COVID at the moment and, and and the world, but a bit more sort of travel with work has been taking place. So I had a, I, I got to get away, which used to happen quite a bit, and it looks like it's going to happen a bit more again, which is lovely. And uh, I got taken up to the Peak District, which I, it's a bit of the UK that I haven't spent enough time in because it was genuinely amazing. It, it's such a beautiful part of the country. The running is superb. Um, it, we were we lucked out massively with the weather. It was just sunshine and blue skies, so I mean that probably helped. But um, I got I, I went up there with New Balance to try out some new bits and pieces with them, um, which this is sort of fairly commonplace. We used to just uh, you know brands would invite us to a sort of a, a weekend and showcase this new product and talk. Get, there'd be someone from the design team there, and we get to sort of have that face to face time with people and understand how they got to the point of releasing our product. And it hasn't happened for you know. Couple of years, so it's, that's been that was really nice, and, and uh, yeah, and then I took me and the, me and the fam went to um, the community track at the Olympic uh, Village, whatever, yeah, London twenty twelve, coming up for ten years, Rick. Um, I know, right? So we went to the uh, we went to the community track with uh, the running club and charity, the Outrunners, who were putting on a uh, a fun run, kind of five ten k, and then loads of sort of like kids races and stuff, and so. Me and my uh, me and my eldest did quite a lot of running, and it was the first time he'd really got involved in a sort of, cum- sort of any sort of like running event. Like it was on a track, do you know what I mean? Like it was on a natural track, and there was like you know Charlie Dark was starting the whole thing, and he, you know like it was it was good, it was really good, and he loved it, and he ended up probably running about a mile. It was nuts. Um, yeah, it was really good. I was very impressed by how how far he could run for like a five and a bit year old. So um. Yeah, I had a, I've had a, I've had a deluge of running positivity. So I, I'm, I'm feeling, feeling pretty buoyant, Rick. And also, I've just, I've just taken order. Um, I, I got some like uh, home gym stuff has arrived. So our build up, our build up to half marathon success begins. So I'm going to start getting, getting strong again, which is, it's another, it's a good thing. So there's, how's that for a little, you know, blurb. That's, oh, you, you, you've been very, very active, Ben. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, I, I, just on, on your last point about kind of, uh, I guess, kind of cross training and strength training, because I've, I'm doing a bit more rowing just because coming back from this knee injury, and I was like, rowing is a, gr- it's so time efficient way of keeping fit. You can, you can, go, you can kind of, you know, do ten or fifteen minutes on a rower, and that's, you feel like you've had a, a cardio with it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it seems to be the way a lot of people are going. Like we've had, you know, Robbie Britton's been on this podcast a bit, and he's. 
he's his running's you know fantastic now and he's done doing more cycling than ever and i just i wonder if we, we get we're entering a kind of almost like the age of the cross training athlete because from a perspective of just the amount of time you can put in when you cross train to so say like say ben say say you're prepared to run 30 miles a week in this half in this half marathon but you but you're actually prepared to, to exercise quite a lot more than that um yeah, it's, it, it provides you with this like opportunity to, if if you have got the time and the inclination, like to actually spend a lot more time during the week actually um, keeping fit, as opposed to if it's really just a running thing with people, then I think there tends to be a kind of upper limit that you hit probably earlier than if you're prepared to mix things up a bit. So yeah, I'm going to try and stick with the rowing, rowing and running, a little bit of strength training. I think that'll do, won't it? I'll be I'll be fit by the end. Mate, absolutely. It's interesting actually that um we talked about how people have been approaching their training and maybe you talk about an era of entering where cross training becomes more prominent i think it's because and i was talking actually so at this new balance event uh, new balance event that i've just been at they actually had um uh one of their athletes there ross millington who who came second in at manchester marathon ran it was the first marathon he ran 211 so he did he did all right um but anyway i got chatting with him about this because we were talking about like a training load and build up to races and how we found it and all this sort of stuff and he's like a sort of quite classic in the sort of like high mileage you know as you can imagine sort of like but we did start talking more and more about how there's this more people are understanding more and more that there isn't one training type that suits everyone so it was kind of and this will I think that maybe the cross training the sense that cross training is going to perhaps become more prominent it's just maybe that more more and more elite people are focusing on alternative ways of training whereas before it would have always just been like I'm just going to do loads of mileage and that's that's the elite that's the elite way so it's it's kind of interesting that you know as you say Robbie Britton's done it who did who else have we spoken to like oh yeah um, Tom Evans is doing more cycling and and slightly less oh yeah that's it and you know like you know and stuff like that and we you know sophie powers always talked about how how sort of low mileage she was doing but for her ultras and stuff yeah so you know rick it's 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 all fair game it's all fair game when it comes to the marathon i think i think i think it i think it is better yeah like say like probably like let's be honest if you if you want to run you know ridiculous times like 211 then yeah you're running's gonna run you're gonna have to run loads and loads of miles but i think for amateur runners it's often like the mileage that they hit isn't the ceiling isn't necessarily about oh i just i can't be i haven't got time i can't be bothered it's it's more like my, my body actually can't take much more running than this because i think if you're running like in excess of say 50 miles a week there's a lot of stuff you need to do like as far as recovery and rest and strength to, to really sort of maintain that over a long period of time whereas with if you if you're prepared to run slightly less than that and cross train then i think you set yourself up for a more sustainable kind of uh training cycle and i think yeah you know that's that's where i'm at with stuff um but then i'm not running i'm not running 211 so maybe yeah it's true and i just tried to lift up all this all the the weights that just arrived i tried to lift up and then incredibly heavy so yeah we'll we'll see how that goes could be a a whole new set of injuries couldn't we yeah like hope oh yeah my my back's gone i've done it wrong i've lifted it up wrong that's it (laughs) right hey look should we do Talking about marathon wisdom that we've sort of imp- we haven't really imparted, have we? We've just been no, we've got none. We've got none. Yep. But Mario Yamuchi's got loads, so I think we should get on our, our guest of the week. Yeah, let's do that. Guest of the week, here in the studio. Guest of the week, sometimes on the phone. Could be an athlete, could be a physio, or a complete unknown. Your journey towards being an elite marathon runner is actually fairly unconventional. You only, only sort of dedicated yourself properly to running in your late twenties, and then you set marathon PB uh, at age thirty-five. Um, what advice would you give to anyone who's going after a goal a little bit later in life? I would say just go for it if you if you have the motivation and the will to do it, and you're able to commit the time and energy to it. I would really go for it. The marathon is an event which you can excel at uh, later in life compared to the other events. And I, I know of runners breaking PBs in their 40s, 50s and beyond. Well, that bodes well, Rick, for us, doesn't yeah. it? Maybe, <laughs> we, maybe, our t- maybe, our, maybe our time to shine is coming. I mean, this is, this is it. Um, I can only hope. Um, one of your chapters in your book is, is called Basics, Basics, Basics. And, and we talk about this regularly, especially with 
uh, new runners but what are some of the basics that we can uh, master that help us uh, with ambitious running goals what are these basics that sometimes get neglected so for me the basics are training fuel and rest Um, these are the fundamentals of running and I think nowadays there's so much information available uh, out there you know from podcasts websites coaches uh, everything that it's easy to forget uh, the basics and as I said training fuel and rest are really key so training the right quality and quantity uh, fuel that means good nutrition and hydration and then rest getting enough sleep looking after yourself it's easy to overlook these basics, but these are the fundamentals of what will make you improve at running. For sure. How how what were your what was your what was a training a big training week like for you when you were when you set your uh, uh, your fastest time at twenty nine, uh, thirty five? Sorry, what was your what was a, what was a sort of week? What did it look like for you? Were you a high mileage kind of runner? So I run on average a hundred miles a week, which for an elite female athlete is not that high, to be honest. I often tried to run more than that, but I found that I got overtrained or injured or would develop niggles. So I accepted that because I was a bit older, I wasn't able to do the traditional high mileage. Um, and I tried to just make sure that every day I was doing training which had a purpose and would was specific for, for the marathon. So I did a mixture of speed sessions and I prioritized longer efforts because I was focusing on the marathon, uh, long runs, and also what I call fast jog, which is a speed at which you can just not have a conversation. And the reason that's important is it it develops a big aerobic engine and develops your fat burning capacity. Yeah, so that, that conversational pace running is sort of, you know, I think one of these basics that's quite often forgotten about, which is just that slow, especially with, you know, people who are striving to run a marathon very quickly, there's a sort of a, everything must be done with a degree of effort and if, yeah, or, or suffering or some sort of degree like that. So it's nice to hear that obviously that that's not always the case or certainly shouldn't be the case for most people. Well, the, the fast jog that I, I mentioned, that's at the point where you just can't have a conversation. So very easy running you can have a conversation if you speed up a little from there to the point where conversation is difficult this is the effort which is good for developing your fat metabolism and a big aerobic engine very easy running in which you can have a conversation easily has its value you know you can you can churn out the miles at that pace without developing excessive fatigue it's relatively easy to recover from miles in the bank helps running economy it's all total mileage. But in terms of physiological adaptation, um, it, it's limited doing very easy jogging. So that's why I really focused on this speed that I call fast jog. It's an interesting one, this, because it's kind of like we often talk about, um, I think one of the buzzwords has been like, you know, keeping your easy runs easy and like polarizing training. And, and actually, ha- but your approach, because in your book, you talk about the middle range and how actually some of the Japanese athletes that you were looking at we're doing more in the middle range. It's maybe what you're talking about with this fast jog. I think that's actually a slightly different approach, isn't it? It's not saying you need to be really doing re- stuff really hard and really easy. You're actually valuing the, the stuff in the middle, which I think is um, something that doesn't get talked about as much anymore. Um, so it's quite an interesting one for you to, to focus on, I think. Yeah, doing training, which is very hard. So anaerobic fast intervals, plus very easy running. This is quite a good approach for... Uh, athletes who are focusing on let's say 3,000 meters cross country which is exactly what I was doing when I was younger so all my training then was really hard anaerobic sessions speed sessions plus easy recovery runs in between Um, and that's fine for cross country and the shorter events but it really neglects the middle range of speeds and those are really important for the marathon because the marathon you can't do anaerobically. That's the whole point of it and, yeah. and how it's different to the shorter events. So you have to build up your aerobic capacity and your fat metabolism in order to do well at the marathon. And this this was really a mistake that I made when I switched to the marathon that I thought, oh, well, I'll just continue what I've previously been doing and just add in some longer long runs and longer intervals. But actually, for the marathon, you really need to focus on those middle speeds could you just um because we talk about how 
and certainly sort of whenever we talk about fueling for a marathon everyone sort of talks about carbohydrate and, and glycogen in the muscles and energy like that but you you've mentioned fat m- metabolism a couple of times could you just sort of like break down the importance of that and why your this approach for you worked what so well yeah so we basically have two fuels we can use fat and carbohydrate we use fat more when we're running more slowly and doing aerobic metabolism and we use carbohydrate more at faster speeds when we're doing anaerobic metabolism. You don't switch entirely from one to the other. At any speed, there will be a mixture of fuels being used, but you will use more fat and less carbohydrate the slower you're going and more carbohydrate and less fat the faster you're going. And for the marathon, you're never anywhere near your top speed other than when you're sprinting for the finish line you're always running somewhat below your top speed because if you didn't you wouldn't reach the end without running out of carbohydrates so fat metabolism and training your body to metabolize fat efficiently is really critical for the marathon one of the other things you have to talk about the book is, is giving yourself the freedom to flourish and seemingly a part of that view is maybe not relying on technology and racing uh, without a watch because potentially a watch could suggest that you're running a pace that you can't sustain when actually if you just allowed yourself to flourish it that you could is that when you ran your best marathons were you watch free and, and what's your thinking <laughs> around the role that technology can and, and can't play when it comes to your best marathon yeah so by freedom to flourish i mean sort of freeing yourself from mental barriers which have the effect of slowing you down or limiting how fast you can run and technology is is one aspect of that so nowadays we all have gps watches we're all very focused on the pace we're running and that's useful in some ways because it allows you to monitor your training and and record exactly what you're doing but i feel it sometimes limits runners because um for example in a training session if i set intervals somebody will always say what pace should i run at whereas an alternative way to look at it is you just do as run as fast as you can Mm -hmm. so i feel watches are gps watches are useful but don't let them stop you from really letting rip and just running freely uh, using your own judgment of effort uh, to to guide how fast or slow you run rather than what your watch says and of course gps watches aren't always completely accurate so you you have to use them where they're useful and how in whatever way they can uh helpfully inform your training but don't become a slave to them is really my message yeah absolutely especially if you're mid-race and it's suddenly gone off sync with the mile markers because you've gone past some tall buildings and you suddenly start panicking because it says you're doing a five minute mile during your halfway through a marathon which is yeah, often, exactly often the case yeah, yeah and also if you when you're training or racing if you ever look at your watch then your brain has to process the information you've just seen and decide what to do about it. Do you ignore it or do you act on it? Do you speed up? Do you slow down? And this is all mental energy and focus that isn't being used for running faster. So some of my best performances I did without a watch or if I if I used a watch, I didn't really pay that much attention to it. And as you say, your watch getting out of sync with the kilometre or mile markers in a marathon, you know, th- this can be a bit... Um, confusing or discombobulating you look at your watch and and it clicks over a mile but you're not the mile marker is nowhere in sight your brain then has to process that whereas if you didn't have a watch on you would just be focusing on your running yeah absolutely i like this idea of of being able to flourish i think you also talk about having goals and setting goals and particularly a primary goal when you start talking or working with runners um why do you think it's important for people to identify this primary goal early on in in their sort of build up to a marathon well as i say in my book goals which goals can be very motivating uh they give you direction they give you something to aim for which is all all great you know there's a sense of the destination uh, uh, having a destination at the end of a finite journey that's all really useful but just having a goal isn't going to make you achieve it you still have to do the hard work um and that's where breaking down goals into short-term and medium goals is is useful because this gives you 
actual concrete things to do uh, day to day, week to week, month to month. Uh, so an overall goal is very useful in terms of motivation, um, but you really need to drill down into the detail of what that means in terms of what you do every day. This is the Runner's World podcast. I get the sense with this book that you're um, prescribing a kind of a simple approach to running, maybe reminding people um, in the kind of running boom that we're experiencing that it's still a simple sport and to get the most out of yourself actually doesn't necessarily require um, beetroot juice, but kind of, you know, it requires um, <laughs> consistent training. Hey, do you, do you, Rick, is that, I really, you know? <laughs> I, I enjoy a nitrate, Rick, don't start. Uh, me, me, me too, me too, but, but yeah, I is, is that a message that you want that you wanted to get across this book? A, a kind of like slight back to basics, like a reminder that running should actually be at its core quite a simple activity. Yes, absolutely. So running is a really simple sport. You know, as I say in my book, you just put on a pair of shoes and some kit and off you go. You can decide where to run, how far, how fast. It's entirely up to you. It's a very simple and inexpensive sport. But I feel that in recent years, we've we've got into the habit of complicating it, perhaps unnecessarily. And people can get fixated on sort of minutiae, which which may have some impact on performance, but it will be small. And they forget that what is really important is training, fuel and rest. So all those details, and beetroot juice is one of them, <laughs> they, can, they can enhance performance. I'm not saying they're entirely redundant, but they're really the icing on the cake. And they will never be a substitute for good training of the right quantity and quality plus fuel and rest. So I think it's a question of balance. Make sure you do those basic inputs properly and then worry about all the extra detail. I think that's great. I mean, do you have anything when sort of the lives that we all live are fairly busy um, and you've got these three pillars of what of how to achieve these running goals how do you what do you advise people to do who are simply very very busy with work and life and family and all those sorts of things what's the sort of structural uh adaptations that people can make to to kind of fit everything in so <clears throat> excuse me habits are really important um you know the habits you make with your training with your food or sleep and this is what will make this is what will make you into a better runner and help you to improve. So, for example, with nutrition, let's say, supposing you want to improve your nutrition, but you're just so busy, it's difficult to find the time and headspace to concentrate on it. What you could do is say, OK, uh, at least four days a week, I'm going to have five vegetables a day, no matter what. And then you can sit down and plan how you're going to do that, when you're going to do it, go and buy them. So just creating small habits for yourself, which will force you to do something which will improve your running, I think is helpful. We're all so busy all, all the time these days that you can think, oh, yeah, I'll improve. I'll try and do better with my running. But if you don't turn it into actual small concrete things, it's easy for time to drift, drift by and, and you haven't really achieved anything. I think it's also useful to be realistic and have a training program which you can do consistently week after week, month after month. If you're trying to do too much uh, and you're finding that you're, you're quite inconsistent with your training or developing injuries or having to skip sessions, then I would say it's better to, to try and do a slightly less ambitious training routine, but do it consistently. It's always better to do a routine consistently to sort of 90 to 95 percent rather than biting off a bit too much and and being inconsistent you spent a lot of time more um, in running and, and working in in japan and obviously that's an, an amazing running culture um amazing successful and dedicated runners in, in that country what, what did you learn from from being based over there that um that you could kind of that other people you think in the in the west could could benefit from so one thing I learned there was focusing on the middle speeds, as we spoke about earlier. I was quite surprised when I went to Japan that I was beating some athletes in the half marathon or in training who were then quicker than me in the half marathon, in, in the marathon, sorry. And that's because they their training is very focused on the marathon. It's very specific. And they're doing a lot of training at slower speeds. So that made me think, okay, maybe my training 
is is mistargeted. Maybe I need to make it more specific to the marathon. Uh, and having seen that and understood that, I then switched my training to focus more on the middle speeds. Um, other things I learned are work ethic and discipline. Japanese athletes train incredibly hard. Um, they're, they're really devoted to their sport, just put their backs into it like I've never seen before. And, and as a result, they're, they're world beaters. Another thing is nutrition. So lots of variety in nutrition. Um, the importance of highly nutritious foods, which I mentioned in my book. So green leafy vegetables, oily fish, colorful vegetables, uh, nuts and seeds, seaweeds, all this kind of thing. Um, and also the, the marathon world there is is massive i mean there are lots of athletes yeah. you know there's a lot of depth uh there are a lot of races the public are really behind the marathon a lot of the races are televised live so it's it's a real sort of experience to see that and and understand what it's like in a country that that really loves the marathon and i'd really recommend that your your readers and anyone listening to this podcast try a race in japan the Tokyo Marathon obviously is the most famous, but it's very difficult yeah. to get into. But there are many other fantastic races there, lots of marathons, but also other races. For example, the Ome 30K, uh, it's quite a hilly course in, on the outskirts of Tokyo. They also have a 10K, that's in mid-February. Um, yeah, so I, if, if any of your listeners have a chance to go to Japan and race, I strongly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had the chance to go out and race in Japan once. It was fantastic. No, no conversation is complete, Marv. Us asking about um, the sort of the changes, good and bad, that, that carbon plated shoes have had on the marathon. And I wonder, some someone like you, who's you know obviously second fastest British female marathon runner, um, you know, records probably will be under threat, not just because of the shoes, obviously because of the fantastic female runners that we've got at that distance. But how do you feel about uh, these shoes coming in and? From a training perspective, do you advise any of the runners you're working with to train differently as a result of what the kind of benefits the shoes can bring? Yeah, so carbon shoes appeared since I retired, so I don't cover them at all in my book, but I do have views about them. And and my my views are mixed really. So on the one hand, if you look at a at it at a systemic level, I think what they've done to the sport is is a shame, if I'm honest, because for example, in the women's elite marathon, they're worth on average about three minutes and yeah. they're at, they're worth on average something like 90 to 100 seconds in the men's marathon at elite level. This is a massive amount. Um, so what's happened is you can't really compare times now with what's happened in the past yeah. in any meaningful way. I mean, when I see incredibly fast times now, I find myself converting back into old money yeah and that's not to dismiss the current athletes as being less good than the the generations that have come before them i'm not suggesting that for a moment they all train just as hard as athletes of previous generations have um but yeah i think it's you know times have moved on across the board men and women in the marathon half marathon 10k so we're, we're in a completely different era and people say, well, technology moves on. But this really is a step change because previously shoes were trying to kind of minimize any um, obstruction to human endeavor, if I can put it like that. So they were very light, very flimsy. What we have now is value added to the human endeavor. It's a spring in the shoes. This this actively gives you energy return. So it's like plus alpha to the human endeavor. What I feel is a slight shame is that running used to be all about just human endeavor, unlike sports which involve a lot of technology like golf or triathlon or cycling. Yeah. Running really was just about human effort. And I feel now we've lost that, that it's, it's no longer just about human effort. It's now about human effort and technology. And actually, I'm not sure there are any sports left now where it's really just about human effort. You could possibly say that with swimming, um, but but that would depend on the pool and 
and so on. Swimming costume and, and all the swim hat and all those sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. So having said all that, I think there are definitely positive aspects to it. So, for example, I've heard that the wear and tear is less. So that can mean you can train with fewer injuries. Um, they Obviously, they make you go faster in races. So that might mean qualification for events which you previously perhaps couldn't have qualified for, for example. Um, it might allow you to uh, prolong your career. It might allow you to train really hard in your youth but not suffer the the physical sort of damage that we see happening to a lot of elite athletes after they retire and get older. I mean, I'm a case in point. I'm 48 now. I constantly get niggles. And <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if that was because of the 10 years of really hard training I was doing in the marathon. Yeah. And I wonder, had I been wearing carbon shoes all that time, perhaps my body now would be not, not, would be not, suffering from quite the wear and tear that it is yeah i think that's that's an interesting point maybe doesn't get talked about as much it's almost like i was thinking when you as you're talking is there a case then for could we say look you can it's too late now but could, at some point could have said well you can train in these shoes but actually when it comes to racing in official times you can't have a sprig in your shoe that's perhaps what should have happened but you're right the horse has bolted it's too late for that i can't see the sport going back and of course all the manufacturers fund the sport so I, I i can't see us going back so whatever your views about the pros and cons of them i think we we have to accept now that we are where we are um you have to use them to your to your benefit and advantage because everybody else is but i think the and i think you have to just bear in mind when looking at records and times you know which when those times were set. So, for example, I was recently pushed down into third place on the UK all-time list by Jess Piasecki uh, by 45 seconds. And Jess is a fantastic athlete. I'm really pleased for her. I'm absolutely not quibbling at all that she has pushed me down the list. I'm, I'm pleased for her. It's fantastic. But if they're worth around three minutes in the elite women's marathon you have to say, okay, are we comparing like with like? And that is no criticism whatsoever of Jess or the other athletes in the current generation. I admire all of them. I know how hard it is. I know they all train hard. Um, but it is just difficult to compare uh, yeah. carbon shoe performances with non-carbon shoe performances. Maybe there needs to be a breakaway running series where everyone is there's a strict criteria for racing flats in every single race and that's how yeah so instead of you know and to qualify everything has to be done in a in a traditional racing flat shoe and that's you know that's the that's the for the purists well that's that's the beauty of cross country and and even trail running i think i think blade shoes aren't going to help you in trail running and they certainly won't in cross country so and of course, cross country is just pure racing. There's nothing about time or distance in cross country. So we, we do still have those. It's really in road running and on the track. And of course, race walking as well. That's, a, that's, a, that's not going to benefit from carbon shoes. So there are pockets of the sport where we're still in the, in the um, you know, in the kind of... <laughs> Pre, Pre-carbon plate world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There we go. There's a nice part to the end of your book where you start looking at um, it's kind of it's a nice holistic dimension, I think, to some of the training that you're um, prescribing is talking about having self-compassion and being kind to yourself. What does this what do you think this looks like for, for most runners? And, and why do you think that's an important aspect of a training program? Because it doesn't necessarily get mentioned as much as it should. Yeah, so it could be things like occasionally skipping a training session if you're feeling really out of sorts or you're you're maybe not well um it could be just accepting that you you perhaps can't do as much in a training routine as you had hoped or it might mean if you find yourself falling out with, out of love with running just taking a break from running i think running is tough you know getting out there training day in day out it's tough no question of course it's 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 enjoyable and many people love it but it's tough as well and keeping keeping going at running day in day out all your life 
I think is is unrealistic. So sometimes um, I think it's fine to just step back and say, okay, I need a break now, or I'm training too much. This is dominating my life, and and just yeah, just just have some self compassion and accept your limits. I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, how much can I run without considering what else is going on in their lives, yeah. and things like work, family. Uh, caring responsibilities all these things take up huge amounts of time and mental and physical energy and you have to look at your life in the round if you're in a stressful period at work for example you might have to accept that your running has to take a bit of a back seat so you you just have to be realistic and and accept your limits I think how do you I mean it's it's such an important part of I guess modern the modern world and being able to view what everyone else is doing constantly, particularly through social media and things like Strava and, and other sort of platforms where comparison is 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 rife. Um, and I think that this this approach, this whole this idea of sort of being self caring and, and knowing when to switch off from running, when all all the, everyone's chat is basically switch on to running constantly. How do you sort of view that element of of the running world now and the sort of influence of others on social media platforms yeah again i have mixed views it's you can learn a lot from observing what other people are doing you know you can see what training they're doing or how somebody's performed and what might have enabled that but equally compare and despair which is which i talk about in my book is often unhelpful because you look at everybody else and you think oh gosh they're going so fast or they look amazing or look at that personal best that person's done and it's easy for your confidence to drain away and, and feel inadequate. So sometimes I think it's it's good to just shut all that out, forget about what other people are doing and concentrate on yourself. And I talk about this in my book because the only person whose behavior and performance you can influence is your own. You, you can't determine what other people do. So sometimes I think it's useful to forget about those people. Just think about yourself. You know, what training can I reasonably do? If I'm having a bad patch, why might that be? Am I sleeping properly? Am I eating properly? Um, and in a way, I'm glad that I grew up and learned to love running before social media existed, before GPS watches existed. And it, it was quite simple. And I just I just focused on myself. So I, I feel for young people now who... You know, if you go out running, you have to put it on Strava. You have to look like a million dollars and <laughs> all the rest of it. You know, how many likes are you getting on your Insta posts and all this? And, yeah, I think, as I said, it's it's nice to engage with people and learn from what others are doing. But it can all just get too much sometimes. And I think you need to just just shut yourself away from it sometimes. So, Mara, where can people go uh, to get hold of, of Marathon Wisdom? Where is it available? So it will be published in June. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but it's already available for pre-order on Amazon.co.uk. Uh, and it will be available for pre-order from other retailers. Uh, but Amazon is the place to go at the moment. Great. Mara, thanks so much for your time coming on the Runners World podcast, talking about um marathon wisdom uh, i think there's something for everyone there in what you said and uh we really appreciate you uh, giving up the time to speak with us my pleasure and thanks very much for having me so that brings us to the end of this week's runners world podcast a huge thanks to our guest mario Yamauchi, and to you of course for listening you can subscribe to this podcast to the runners world magazine uh to a newsletter just get on the internet do some googling and you'll find all of the right things to do but most importantly this podcast subscribe to it there's like a button on your app that you're listening into right now it'll say subscribe click it it's the best thing you can possibly do um thank you for listening you will hear from us again next week <laughs>